Good morning to you all. It's good to be with you uh, once again. Our scripture reading this morning is from John's Gospel and chapter 17. John's Gospel and chapter 17. And we're going to read from verse 6 of John's Gospel and chapter uh, 17. Verse 6, John 17. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me, sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. When I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctified myself, and they were that they may truly be sanctified. And we trust God will add his blessing to his word uh, this morning. We have really just uh, one verse on my mind uh, particularly, um, as I read that particular portion, and it's in verse 9, and it's just four words. I pray for them. I pray for them. Just over a fortnight ago, uh, Jean and I came back from the Bible Educational Services International Conference. Uh, we have these conferences every five years, and delegates came from 40 different countries from every continent in the world, and we were there for a week together, and there's no doubt about it, we had a great and wonderful time. There was a little bit of a, a difficulty, though, uh, because... One by one, people started to get ill. Colds, coughs, laryngitis, it was quite difficult. And Jig and I got on the plane to come home and we thought, well, we managed to get away from that until I got home. And uh, ever since, I've had coughs and colds and goodness knows what. Uh, in fact, the pharmacist um, in our village said to me in the week, when I asked him for something to cure me, he said, I think you've probably had COVID. And probably that was the case. I just don't know. But I was at a Bible study on Tuesday evening, and I gave the message. And then it was a time of prayer for the folks in the church. And the leader of the church prayer meeting said, Stephen, we will pray for you. And I was so thrilled and encouraged by that. And as I was going home, I thought, well, when somebody says that, they mean that they care for you. And that was encouraging. And then I thought to myself, when somebody says that, they make a commitment that they will do exactly what they've said. 
And I thought to myself, it's not only care and commitment, but people who do that have the confidence to know that God hears and answers prayer. Well, I may still have a coughing fit in the middle of the sermon. I don't know. Uh, I may still have a cough when I go home. But um, I believe that God does hear and answer prayer. Let me give you an illustration. Not this past week, but the previous week on Tuesday morning, I was going to the biggest school in our area, Big Middle School, uh, to take school assembly. Uh, I was a little bit, shall I say, anxious. I'd been going to that school for nearly 30 years, and in Easter, the head who'd been there for 17 years retired. So I was going to meet the new head a week last Tuesday for the very first time. I always try and get the head who's retiring to book me in for the next term because I find that's a big help. And so I went along with some trepidation because you remember when um, we start the book of Exodus and we read about Pharaoh, it uh, says there was a Pharaoh came who knew not Joseph. And uh, I often think that maybe if a new head is appointed who doesn't know me, that may not be particularly helpful. We know what Pharaoh did in those particular days. So it was a little bit anxious and uncertain when I went to the school. And I got started to fit myself up uh, with the laptop and so on. And then the new head appeared. And she said, hello, Stephen. It's nice to see you. And I thought, I don't know this lady. I don't remember ever seeing her before. How did she know my name even? And she said, I used to be a student at this school 25 years ago <laughs> when you used to come and take assembly. And then I said to her, well, I don't know where you've come from. She said, well, I used to be in another school she mentioned that I used to go to. She said, you used to come there for assembly. So I thought, praise God. Yes, amen. Answer to prayer. Yes. God does hear and answer prayer. But that was not the end because uh, I've got a fairly reliable laptop and I plugged it in and booted it up and it booted up and it booted up and it booted up and it booted up and it would not boot up. Well, this particular school, they have a, a very big projector uh, like you've got uh, and they keep the remote in a little safe there so it doesn't go wandering. And if I, I don't know the combination of the safe, so there's a technical uh, manager for the school and I usually have to tra chase around the school to find him. Um, to get them remote control. Um, but this particular day, he was in the hall, which was really helpful. But uh, he's more than really helpful because when I went to the retirement due of the head teacher just before Easter when she retired, a lady came up to me and she said, Hello, Stephen. And I hate that because I looked at her and I thought, Who the dickens are you? <laughs> and she said, do you know, at the end of the 70s, when you had a tent mission on our estate, you gave me a prize. And she said, I still value that prize, and I'm thankful for it. I don't know what I gave her. I have no idea. She said, I'm the cook. And then she said, my son is the IT worker here. Oh. So I got links there. And when he was in the hall, I said to him, Charlie, can you get my laptop sorted? And he did all sorts of things, and he's one of these wizards, all sorts, you don't know what he's doing. And he said, I don't know what's happening. But eventually, just as the last child came into the school assembly, it worked, and once again, God hears and answers prayer. It's marvelous, isn't it, how it actually works day by day in our own situations, and how especially important that is um, for us to recognize we can come to him at any time about anything, and we have that confidence to know that God hears and answers prayer. So the Lord Jesus said to his disciples in this prayer, and you may have noticed that the title of the section I read to you in my NIV says, Jesus prays for his disciples. If you remember, this is the setting. Um, the Lord Jesus had gone to the upper room. They'd instituted what we've done this morning, the taking of bread and wine, we're not too sure whether John 13, 14, 15, and 16 all took place in the upper room. We can't be sure. But at some stage, he left the upper room and with his disciples made his way towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you look at chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. So at some stage, between the upper room 
and going across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed this quite remarkable prayer. And some have said this is one of the most remarkable chapters in the whole of the Bible. Remarkable because we are actually hearing and listening to the very words that God the Son prayed to the Father. That's amazing, isn't it? That we are actually listening to the very words that God the Son prayed for God the Fa uh, prayed to God the Father. We can hear exactly what was said. The longest prayer that we have recorded of the Lord Jesus, we have many prayers that he recorded because he was a man of prayer, as we know. I think Luke tells us there are seven or eight occasions when he actually prayed in a quiet place. We know that there are times when he told parables about prayer and gave teaching about prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer in every sense. But this is the most remarkable prayer that we have recorded as we look at it. And maybe it is an example of prayer. And we can learn lessons from what he actually said on this occasion. But there's something even more special. Most people would say this is a pattern and a picture of his high priestly prayer. And that's why I chose those first two hymns that we sang, Jesus is King and I will extol him. We have a priest, and we sang about that. Before the throne of God above, I have a, a certain priest there. We sang about that as well. And that pointed our direction. So we know that the Lord is actually praying in heaven. And uh, Romans 8 tells us this. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died? More than that, he was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Romans 8 tells us in verse 34, 35, that Jesus is praying for us. And here is a prayer that he made, which is a pattern, a picture of what's going on in heaven even now. And just to make sure that we understood that, Hebrews 7, verse 25, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. As high priest, he is there interceding for us. And we need to grasp that. And if we wonder what he's praying about, here's the picture, here's the pattern here for us. So he prays. And as he prays, quite clearly, as we have it in verse 9, he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. Now, there are several lines of thought that themes that run through John 17. One is the Lord emphasizes quite clearly the world. And he mentions it here. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. He mentions I am in the world. I am not of the world any more than I am of the world. Uh, a bit later on in what we read. He talks about the world. I perhaps need to explain that. <clears throat> what he means is the world in which we live, the society, it's not so much the creation that God made, the world that he made, beautiful as we know that is and lovely on this particular morning, but we recognize particularly the world is the, the place that we live and what a place it is. We live in this world of darkness, of ignorance, of immorality, of indifference, of idolatry, so many things that are all around us, and we live in that world. And the Lord Jesus is praying for his disciples, who he knows are going to continue in that world. He's praying for us in that situation. When we were at the conference, I was asked to lead a session, and uh, my session was entitled The Urgency of Reaching Children, which has been my life, so it wasn't a particularly difficult subject to think about. But one of the titles that I used in my talk was The Trauma of Young People Today. And we talked about all the things that they have to face in this godless world in which we live. 
and how much we must need to pray for them particularly. But he prays for us in that world where there's everything opposed to what is of God. Without God, without Christ, without hope, we know it's how it is in this world in which we live. And how important it is to just realize that up above, he's praying for us in this situation. And why is he doing that? He says this, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. And this is something that occurs several times in this chapter. Uh, for instance, in verse 6, you gave them to me. And then he says in verse 24, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am. And so we get a picture here, which is not illustrated, I don't think, really anywhere else, that God in his sovereign grace has brought us to himself to the family of God, as children of God. And he has given us as a sort of inheritance to his son. So we belong to the son. So there's a lovely little song that we sometimes sing. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. We sometimes sing an older hymn that says, I am his and he is mine forever and forever. But just picture the very special thought that God brought us to himself. I'm not going into election or predestination or all of that. The sovereign Lord chose us and brought us to himself at some stage in our lives. And he has given us to the Lord. We are his, shall I say, uh, his inheritance. So he prays for us. Our granddaughter is uh, 16, and uh, she's just been through all the hassle for about six weeks of GCSEs. And uh, it's been a, we've been praying for every morning, history, geography, science, maths, English, whatever it was. Um, granddad particularly pray for Spanish. I hate it. I said, I don't know why you're studying it, but you know what I am. Um, but uh, on Friday night was the prom. And uh, we got this lovely picture of our daughter, our granddaughter, who is, to be honest, quite stunning. And she looked quite remarkable. And our heart goes out to that young lady growing up in this world. And you've probably all got grandchildren or um, relatives that you've got in your families. And what a world they live in. And we need to pray for them. And that just helps us to picture what the Lord is saying. I'm praying for these people in the situation in which they live. And we go a little bit further down the list of what he says to them, and you'll just follow me with the verses. He says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. What he's really saying is, I care for these people, the disciples particularly. I am committed to pray for them. I'm confident that my prayers will be heard, as it were. And I do this because... They have brought glory to me. Glory has come to me through them. And we may ask the question, how can that possibly be that I should bring glory to the Son of God? But when you think about it, this is how it is. First of all, we have brought glory to him because we've come out of the darkness of this world into the family of God and we are part of his inheritance that God has given to him. And that brings glory to him. And we think of all that he has done for us as we thought on the cross this morning. And because of that great sacrifice he made, we have brought glory to him because we belong to him. And that's the sense in which he says this. But he says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So what he's really saying is this. I pray for them in the situation that they are in the world, but I pray particularly that you will protect them by the power of your name. And we realize just how significant and how important that is, that we should know his protecting care day by day. 
We know that the beginning of John tells us he was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. We're in that world, as I've tried to be explaining to you. But the Lord opens his heart and he uses this term that apparently is only here in the New Testament. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. And we need that protection, don't we? In the world in which we live, how important that is for us. We realize this, that um, he's not praying for the world, but he is praying for us. And as one of the great commentators says, the only way we can reach the world is to be kept by him. Then we can go forth and witness for him. But we can't witness for him if we failed in the world today. Our testimony doesn't mean anything at all, does it? If we have failed, if we have strayed, if we have sinned, if we've lived a life that is not different from the world in which we live. And so he said, I will protect you. I will protect you. And we know that his hand is upon us. He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And that sort of protection by him is so very important indeed. Two songs came to mind as I was um, thinking about this, both of which we used to sing at camp quite a lot. The first one was based on Proverbs 18. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. In the righteous tower in which we come to, the Lord himself, we're safe in his hands. And way back, you know, a lot of years ago now, there was a song that became very popular and certainly became popular at camp. There is power in the name of Jesus. We believe in his name. We have called on the name of Jesus. We are saved. At his name, the demons flee. At his name, captives are freed. For is there is no other name that is higher than Jesus. The power of his name. And you and I are protected by the power of his name. What a power that is. There's that poor man in Acts chapter 3. He's never been able to walk. He's 40 years old. He's brought each day to the temple gate to beg for money. And Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he rises up and walks, goes leaping and praising God into the temple. That's the power of a name. And that's the name, powerful name, that protects you and I in this world in which we live. We need to recognize the, the power of that. But he prays something more, and he says, um, I pray for their protection so that they may be one, this is at the end of verse 11, as we are one. So he's praying about the situation that they're in. He's praying about the protection that they need, and he's praying for their unity. And when you think about it, that was a big prayer for him, there were 11 disciples there, as far as we know. Judas had gone out, of course, and they didn't get on too well. Even when they were going towards Gethsemane, they were discussing about who was the greatest. And we know how often Peter used his mouth before his mind and said the wrong things, did the wrong things. They were a pretty rough bunch. And Jesus prayed that they might be one. They might be united together. There's a deeper significance for us, I think. It means that as we become like Christ, we become more like each other, and we are therefore become united together as one. And how important that is. The church history is absolutely strewn with division and difficulties and falling apart and everything that can happen. We need to pray for unity amongst God's people. Such an important part of what we believe in and what we think is so uh, true for us, to pray for unity. And there's no doubt about it, the world doesn't have that, but we have it and we can praise God for that. Paul wrote uh, to the church at Philippi and he said, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. You stand as one man, united. Used to be a saying, didn't there? United we stand, divided we fall. 
and uh, how true that often is in the days in which we live. How important it is, therefore, to recognise this, that we are united and need to be united. And he goes on and uses that in the next part of the prayer that I didn't read to you, where he continues to pray that they might be one, even as we are one. I said this is an example prayer, and I wonder how often, maybe you do more than I do, but I don't think I pray very often that my fellow believers may be given extra help in the world in which we live. Do I pray for their protection as the Lord Jesus did? Do I pray for unity as the Lord Jesus did? These are questions perhaps I've began to think about as I read one commentator that said, this is a good example prayer for us in the day in which we live. Even though it was said 2,000 years ago, we still need prayer in the world in which we live. We certainly need prayer for protection, and we certainly need prayer for unity. But he goes on a little bit further, and uh, having talked about um, the um, Judas, and we won't go into that one, verse 13, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. The full measure of my joy within them. So he's praying for joy for them. Now this is tough, isn't it? At the end of John 13, when we know he was in the upper room, two things have been said which must have concerned everybody. Number one, one of them was going to betray them, and we know that happened. And one, number two, Peter was going to deny the Lord, and we know that happened. And number three, really, I suppose, he was going to go away and leave them. They were sad. They were shocked. They were surprised. They didn't know who was going to betray him. And Peter was adamant he would never let the Lord down and he would not deny the Lord. But the Lord was going away. They were so sad. And he says, even in that time when I'm not going to be here because I am coming to the Father, he says in verse 13, I want them to know the full measure of my joy within them. How important that is. The full measure of my joy within them. Even in sad, difficult experiences, we can still joy in the Lord. Some years ago, I was preaching in a church, which shall be nameless, but could be representative of many churches, and somebody just gave me an nod and said, that guy over there uh, has just come out of prison, first time he's been in a church, but we know a bit about him. So I said to the um, fellow as he went out, I shook hands, said, nice to see you, thank you for coming, hope you'll come again. And uh, he looked at me, he said, not likely. I said, oh, did I say something that offended you? No, he said, want you. He said, I've just come from a place where everybody's sad and miserable and really down at the bottom of their life. And he said, I came here and all I saw was sadness and miserableness. <laughs> and I thought, well, how many churches did that apply to? We can all be often weighed down with the burdens of our life when really as we meet together, we have so much to be joyful about and to joy in the Lord. And uh, that should come across, not just in the way we sing, but in our very deportment, in our life. We are here with a real sense of joy. And the Lord made that very clear. He, he wanted them to know that. And I think three times in this last part of the, uh, his, the chapter of John, he talks about prayer. He says this, I have told you this so that, may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So he's longing that these disciples would have real joy in the Lord. We can joy in the word of God. We can joy in each other's company. We can joy in the fact that we belong to Christ. But most of all, we joy in him and in all that he is. And that helps us to recognize the need for the full measure of joy in him. Just very quickly, the last two things, as our time is virtually gone. But you'll notice in verse 15, 
My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you will protect them from the evil one. If ever Satan is active, he is active today. He's active in our world, isn't he? He's active in our churches. He's active in our lives. That's why I've been reminded us of that scripture in 1 Corinthians. When we take bread and wine, we examine ourselves and maybe need to confess things that it not, shouldn't be in our lives because the evil one is active. And I believe, uh, a thought that you might think about, that from this moment when the Lord prayed that till he finished the work on the cross, the battle against the evil one was there. It was there as he went to Gethsemane. He battled with evilness of Satan there at the trials. And if Satan could have set him apart from going to the cross, that would have happened, but he couldn't. The Lord Jesus went there. You remember when Peter said, Lord, you mustn't die, you mustn't suffer. That's not right. Be this far from you. And Jesus said, these are the words of Satan, Peter. I've got to die. But Satan would do everything he could to stop that because he knew that this was the way in which God was going to make salvation for all mankind. And there on the cross, he took the power of Satan away. And we live in a world, though, where he is still very active. And the Lord is praying that we might be protected, not only from all that's around us, but by the evil one. And finally, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctified myself. So he's praying that they will be sanctified that they might be set apart. Putting it in modern English, that they will be different, that they will be distinctive, that our lives in our homes, in our workplace, in our, amongst our neighbours, in our church, we stand out as different. Different. And we are, aren't we? I don't know why, but there was a stream of traffic right the way from Westmore's down here going in the Southampton direction. Some of you may know something, oh, I don't know, whether there's about 15 cruise ships up there or what, I don't know, but everybody was going up in that direction. And they weren't in a place of worship, were they? We are different. Praise God that we are. But it needs us to live like that in a world, and Jesus said, I pray that they will be set apart, they'll be sanctified. He prays for us in our situation. He prays for our protection. He prays for our unity. He prays for our joy. He prays for our victory over the evil one. And he prays for our sanctification, being set apart for him. And he's doing that, interceding for us at God's right hand. What an encouragement that is to us. What an encouragement and a blessing it is to us. As I said, when somebody says to you, I pray for you, it shows care, it shows commitment, and it shows confidence that these things will happen. So Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to shift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fell not. And I'm absolutely convinced that that prayer was answered because that feeble, weak man who often failed stood up in front of that great crowd and preached a sermon in the like of which there's never ever been before or since. And that was because he prayed and God answered his prayer. And the Father, as it were, answered the prayer of the Lord Jesus and Peter did all that he did. Much to think about there, isn't there? I think we've got a final hymn. I don't know if I can find it. Oh, 